We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. We are back on our roundtable discussion on the state of liberty and order circa 2022, joined by Liberty Nation's power triangle, socio-political correspondent Jeff Charles, legal affairs editor Scott Cosenza, and economics correspondent Andrew Moran. So, Andrew, let's discuss economics. $30 trillion in national debt for the United States of America. That is an affront to the liberty of future generations. We're going to have to pay it off. Is it more one party or both who have allowed this to spiral out of control? And can we reverse this curse? And if so, how? Well, first, it's not just $30 trillion. It's also $120 trillion in unfunded liabilities and expenditures. But both parties have been atrocious on the national debt issue. Bush doubled the national debt. Obama tripled it. Trump accelerated this growth. Biden is just maintaining the status quo. It's a joke at this point. I mean, you, you look at you look when Bush was in power. Democrats were complaining about the national debt and we're not going to raise the debt ceiling. Then Obama took power. The Republicans, they're the ones who complained about the national debt and said, oh, we're not going to raise a debt ceiling. Trump took office. Democrats complain. Biden's in power. Republicans complain. So it just, it's just it's 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 kicking the can down over both parties. And they've done a massive job at that. Now, can you reverse course? Most likely not. I mean, you look at the 2010 or 2011 sequester, you know, Republicans, and Democrats, they reached a deal whereby they cut $85 billion in spending. But at the same time, the rate of uh, debt growth accelerated. So only in Washington can you have a spending cut while the national debt still grows. Right. So overall, there's no way of reversing anything. The issue is going to get worse. And now you have rising interest rates and just gonna, that's going to compound the problem and lead to, you know, eventually long term, you're going to have to make all these sacrifices that I'm not sure politicians are willing to make. $85 billion at this point in time is, has become a rounding error for the federal budget. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it really has. Mm-hmm. And Jeff, I don't see anybody in either party talking about the national debt. We used to call it a ticking time bomb. They have the national debt clock, which you really have to avert your eyes to realize the kind of debt the country is piling up. But why is it that nobody wants to even discuss uh, the national debt, not to mention making it a central issue. You know, I think it's, it's because people don't think that they're going to have to deal with the consequences of it. They think it's going to be, that's why the can keeps getting kicked. You know, people talk about there being a uniparty, not if there was one issue that would be the best to prove that with the best evidence that there is a uniparty is the national debt because just like andrew so expertly explained both parties have done it and it's not even that like you can say one party is worse than the other that's that's not even the case they both work together to continue blowing out the debt i remember when i was younger in my 20s that was always a big deal oh we got to deal with the debt deal with the debt now the government didn't really care about it but at least people on the on the airwaves and interwebs would pretend to care about it you know we get these people in there they do nothing about this nobody talks about it i think that right now us having this conversation is probably the only political outlet that has talked about the debt since like 2010 indeed tim tim if i may just may want make one point before you uh, go to scott there's actually one person in washington who's actually discussed the national debt every single year and that's Rand paul ever since he arrived to washington every year he's proposed a balanced budget amendment and republicans continually deny him that i remember one of the late, latest ones he said let's balance the budget in a year Lindsey Graham went ballistic and just kicked him off the Senate floor. I said, oh, you know, you're you're an ally of Putin if you want to balance the budget. So Rand Paul, give kudos to him there. He's one discussing it. So, Scott, yeah. uh, I think it because because is- because what Vladimir Putin wants is for us to balance our budget. I'm, I'm sure that's exactly <laughs> what he wants. So, Scott, I think it was in 1964 that Barry Goldwater said there's not a dime's worth of difference between the parties. Or maybe it was George Wallace. I forget. But the point is that, you know, we're in a bipolar sort of political climate, always have been, two-party system. How much difference do you see between the parties? Is it a dime's worth of difference or not even a dime? Uh, Probably not on the debt issue. And I just want to quickly answer your original question. You you said that this is a, you know, uh, it's outrageous to, to kind of 
saddle future generations with this, Tim. And I think that uh, both that you're right and also that they won't be saddled with it, that, you know, we've already uh, got a declining birth rate. So be below the replacement rate and in, in two generations or maybe three, uh, when the debt service on that debt becomes more than anybody could spend on anything else, they're just going to say, you know what? You loan these baby boomers and these Gen Xers and whoever else is this money, get it from them. We're we're not paying. So whether that means they go to a, a different currency or inflate the dollar to where, you know, you have to carry a truckload around to buy a stick of gum, they'll they'll there'll be some way to get out of it, I think. Uh and uh or or just the collapse of the country. But but I don't think that future generations will be saddled with it. I think they'll duck out. Well, actually, there will be a solution by just printing half of the nation's money supply, just paying off debt that way, and then having a currency crisis. So, I guess that's, that that would be the solution, Scott. So, okay. so a- Andrew, <laughs> what is what is the uh, short and long term impact of both the debt and unbalanced budgets, where we show huge deficits of in the range of four trillion dollars every single year? What's the short and long-term impact because most politicians and citizens, I think, uh, don't think about it and don't believe there's any kind of real impact on them. Well, short-term, I mean, you're already starting to see it. The, the interest payments are about 400 to $500 billion a year. That's more than some of the some, some of the Washington bu- uh, departments have. Uh, this eats to, this eats to, this eats to, well, in theory, anyway, it would eat into the budget, force politicians to cut back, but they haven't done any of that. Long-term, that's going to eat into, as, as Scott alluded to, when you have uh, higher debt, higher interest rates, your your debt service, your debt servicing payments going to be about a trillion dollars. That That's going to be eating, that's going to force the government to start slashing entitlement spending. Nobody wants to do that, of course. So then maybe that would eat into defense spending or military spending. Nobody wants to do that, of course. So overall, I, I may I may have kid before, but what you're going to have to do is that you have the Federal Reserve just co- completely print more money, buy more treasury bonds, and that would be the solution to the problem. But of course, that's not a that's not a viable solution for the health of the economy, future generations. But of course, how reckless politicians are and policymakers are, that's the only thing I can think of how you can you know solve the debt issue. But that's not going to happen. I mean, look at uh, Comptroller David M. Walker. He he talked about this back in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, how eventually everything is spiraling out of control today. He predicted back then, but nobody heeded his advice. Nobody's nobody's going to heed anyone's advice today. So, Jeff, uh, we had a change in Congress, not in the Senate, but in the House with Republicans now in charge with a very slender majority, even smaller than the Democrats had last time. But they control the purse strings now. So do you think the Republicans are going to pretty much shut down the spigot on spending uh, or are they going to go along to get along thinking that in 2024, since people seem to care more about order and spending than liberty, that they're going to go in another direction? (laughs) My my laughter is my answer. I mean, yeah, of course they're not. I mean, they're going to talk a big game. And then they're going to get into office just like they always do. I mean, that's how they get elected. I mean, Republicans and conservatives have been going. We've seen this movie before, right? I mean, they've been going through this for for decades. So I don't expect them to do much. I I expect them to do something, you know, posturing wise. And maybe they'll take some action here and there. But in general, I don't think that Republicans are going to be serious enough to actually do much to uh, put a stop to the agenda here. I mean, I guess one thing that Republicans can take solace in is that it will be harder for Biden and the Democrats to push the the more radical elements of their agenda through. But as far as overall change, I wouldn't expect to see a whole lot. The Republicans already said that they're not going to go over this certain amount. So I think Biden, he wants about $1.7 trillion in new spending. And the Republicans said, sure, but we're not going to go over that amount. So they're already laying out their cards. It's ridiculous. The joke line in the it, sand. And this is supposed to be their bread and butter. This is what the <clears throat> conservatives are supposed to be good on. But they're they're terrible at it. Reagan, hey, everyone loves Reagan, but he was terrible at fiscal management too. Republicans, this whole idea they're great at this, and the fiscal conservatives, it's a joke. Well, what Ronald Reagan essentially did was he made a deal because the Democrats controlled Congress. He was going to get defense spending that he wanted, but only if he allowed the domestic spending that Tip O'Neill wanted in return. And that was the deal with the devil, some might call it, that they did make. But we're going to use this as an opportunity to take one more quick break. And then we'll come back with our power trio. 
to wrap up our discussion on the state of liberty circa 2022. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. Entertaining, informative, and just plain fun. Watch Liberty Nation's The Conservative Five. Produced by conservatives for conservatives. C5 is the left free zone. Hosted by Liberty Nation's Hi, Lisa K. Donner. Joined by a raucous, irreverent panel Maggot of authors. Friendly. Deconstructing the leftist narratives. Debating the hot, hot topics. topics and remembering to laugh. <laughs> Join the official conservative safe space. You only did that to piss Jeff Liberty off. Liberty Nation's The Conservative Five.